Hello and welcome to the Life Together podcast, where we share in meaningful conversation about living for Christ and loving one another. Thanks for joining today, and we hope you enjoy this episode. Hey everyone, I'm here today with Phil Robertson to talk about the way of evangelism. And I just love any time that you and Cheryl are in town, love getting to spend time with y'all, hear your your wisdom, and uh, appreciate your family a lot. Um, got to see Gray a few weeks back. That was really cool. But we're really glad that you're here and uh, really glad that we could carve out this little bit of time to uh, have another conversation. So welcome back to Lost River and welcome to your second time uh, on the podcast. <laughs> hey, thanks, brother. It's just great to be here. This is such a wonderful family in Christ. And anytime we get to hang out with you, Lawrence, and the Garys, and, and Randy, Natalie, just the whole gang, it's great. In fact, it's it's so neat. We feel so connected here just through relationships over the years. But now with uh, the, the families that come down and work Florida camp with us, it's mm. just the Pearsons and the Birches. And so, uh, so yeah, there's a there's a strong connection, so it's fun. Yeah, it's just fun. So thank you. Yeah, well, we love that. It's it's so fun, all the connections. But when I when I asked you about doing another podcast, um, you you had an idea like almost right away the the way of evangelism. But uh, evangelism is one of those churchy words, you know. It's like we no one uses that word outside of a church setting. So maybe we can start with this first of all. What what do you mean by evangelism? What does evangelism mean? And then why why are you so passionate and fired up about this? Maybe specifically right now, but I know that this has been a big part of your life and ministry uh, from the time that I've known you. So So just kind of break that down for us. How would you define evangelism for everybody? And uh, and then what makes you so uh, passionate about it? Well, uh, t- to me, evangelism isn't a program; it isn't a system. It's just a way of life, yeah. and and we're disciples of Jesus. And there's nothing more important than sharing that story. And we get to share the story. Mm-hmm. We we get to share the story of salvation. We get to share the story of grace. the The Lord allows us to be his messengers. I, I don't know about you, but I, there's not too many people in my life I would let speak for me. <laughs> you know, hey, hey, if you'll go speak for me and share the way I feel, I was like, okay, that's going to be a very short list. But the Lord lets us speak for him, and that's the way he wants the message to be shared. And to me, that's at the core of who we are as disciples of Jesus, to share his message, to share that with others. And it's a blessing. It's a privilege. It's, it's just a way of life. It's, it's who we are. Yeah. Well, I, I love that description. It reminds me of Isaiah. I forget exactly which chapter, but it, it came to mind when uh, the Lord calls forth Israel as a witness. And it's like, oh, wow, what a prestigious position. And then it goes on to describe you're blind, you're mute, you're lame. <laughs> it's yeah. like, but God says, I'm going to do a work ultimately through my servant, which is, of course, Jesus, that's going to reverse that. And you're going to become the faithful witness that I always wanted you to be. And so here we are, uh, you know, half maimed. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes we're blind and, and mute and deaf, and it, but God wants to use us to to share his good news with with the world which i guess is in the in the most uh basic way i guess is what evangelism quite literally means just sharing the good news um being a good newser yeah um so so what it, i mean what a good life to live and and also if if i can just add to that we're more apt to do something when we see the fruit of it and and let's just be honest for a lot of us when it comes to evangelism it is a little scary uh and maybe we haven't seen the fruit because if you go overseas we're actually going to the philippines here in a couple of weeks so cheryl and i are going over taking some students with us we know that over there in in countries like that in third world countries the gospel is spreading like crazy and i think for us living in the states 
what hampers evangelism is we're we're not seeing the fruits as much you know or we feel the pushback uh from others and so maybe we're not as energized to do it but but i would suggest i would suggest yeah. the fields are as wide as harvest for harvest here is they are over there yeah. and and when i think of my role as a preacher i'm a preacher i'm a minister i'm an evangelist well what does an evangelist do an evangelist evangelizes yeah that's what we do yeah. and and when we get to see the fruit of it it gets us excited yeah that is exciting and i i want to hear about that trip maybe toward the end maybe we can circle back to that uh, but you you brought up the idea of these fields, um, the analogy that Jesus uses, and I think that's so helpful to to think in terms of there there are these different mission fields, and maybe we can think of it in kind of like four ways, kind of four categories that come to mind. These sort of fields of evangelism. The, the first, uh, or maybe I'll just kind of lay all of it out so we have like the working model and then we can uh, maybe break it down. But uh, thinking in kind of concentric circles, it's like the mission field of family, friends, fellow citizens, and then foreigners. Going with all no, Fs here. I like that. So that's just how it was coming to mind. But fa- thinking of family is like th- this is your kids who are born and raised in the church, you have a missional field that is ripe for harvest, you know, right underneath you. And uh, that is no less important than the last one, the fourth one, the foreign evangelism. And so- sometimes we, we forget that or, you know, we, we place more emphasis on, you know, going to these other nations and that that's what evangelism is really all about. But I think this idea that there are these fields ripe for harvest. Well, we've got a whole field right here of family, of people who are born and raised right here who ought to be like our number one priority because they're, they're, they're already among us. Uh, but then I, I think of friends being, these are people who are friendly with the church. Maybe they're even coming week in and week out. Uh, maybe they've even been here months at a time, but the church has maybe not followed up with them, not reached out, not connected, not built any kind of relationship, and not led them to Christ. Um, so, so they're they're friendly, but they're not a part of the body of Christ just yet. Um, and then I think of fellow citizens. These are these are the people you know who who you pass by every day. Uh, they're the people who serve your Sunday lunch. Uh, they're the people that uh, are your uh, your grocers and cashiers and baristas and all of that. And they're the people who you, you work with. They're um, your friends and neighbors. And there's a whole missional field there. Um, and maybe that's where we most often think of evangelism, at least I would say that was that was kind of my experience, that the main field of evangelism when when preachers and teachers would talk about it was that missional field. Uh, but then the last one being that that f- foreigners, um, that they're they're people who uh, church and Christ- maybe Christianity as a whole is just foreign to them. They don't know. They don't know about Jesus. And so we go into, and may, maybe that means literal foreigners in another nation like the Philippines, or maybe that's on the other side of the tracks. Maybe that's just people who just do not have any connection whatsoever with uh, knowing Jesus. But those are kind of the, the missional fields. So I want to just get your reaction to that, and then maybe we can kind of use that as a working model throughout our conversation and uh, maybe zero in on where we're going with it, the work at Valrico and some of the things that y'all have done there. But what's, is that, is that a helpful model or is that completely wrong? Or? Dude, that's amazing. <laughs> I love that. In fact, I'm writing that down. I'm going to take that and use that in a sermon. Uh, no, that's great stuff. No. And, and let, let me just say from, from our standpoint, like when I decided to go into full-time preaching, all right. And, uh, this was going to be my focus. Cheryl and I had a long conversation and, uh, the conversation was, Don't go save the world and lose your own kids Mm. because you see that a lot. And so our big mantra is 
win the first mission field, Mm -hmm. win the first mission field. Uh, No matter what church we've worked with, I mean, that that is what is said over and over and encouraged over and over and over again. Make it make it so your kids can't help but follow Jesus and and win that first mission field. That is Mm. so 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 important and so for churches and like well like what y'all have here at lost river you focus on your kids you know it's just like any community if the schools are good well that's where everybody wants to live your, your value goes up <laughs> when the schools are good and it's the same thing in churches and can we really say our church is sound if we're losing half our children well how sound are you i don't know what people be, everybody's got their own definition of soundness but who cares if you get a few quote issues theological issues right and you're losing your kids that's not very sound yeah. you know to me so when the first mission field so i love that i love that a lot and then you know your visitors your seekers those friends as you say yeah then then that's your next focus yeah i, I want to go back to something that you said there uh you know, I, I, I think we, we've all seen this, whether it's with preachers or entire churches, where they're kind of like hemorrhaging young people. You know, it, mm-hmm. they're just flowing out of the church in a vast number. Um, and, you know, I, I think it's, it's good to have that critical lens looking backward. Like, so much of the critique has been outward-focused, I think, in a lot of churches, where it's this mentality of, ah, oh, the world— they're just so bad. They go off to college and then they just lose their lose their faith because the world's so bad and all these colleges are so bad or the friends they made are just and that's that can be absolutely true. That can be absolutely true and and that's largely what I think some of this parenting seminar is about like helping our kids make wise decisions so that they be, they become independent thinkers and have their own faith all of that. But if there's this consistent number of young people falling away, you start to ask the question, well, is it me? Is it, is it us? Are, are we doing something uh, or not doing something that is forcing young people a- away? You know, what, what can we do to uh, connect on a deeper level at the earliest level? What can we do as a church to, as families and as churches, uh, to... Um, to not lose so so many young people, and so all that being said, I'm I'm really grateful for uh, for the work y'all have done in in that way, and and that kind of leads to maybe what was the start of your work at Glen Springs. So you've mentioned how when y'all got to Glen Springs, there was kind of a recent history of that very problem of uh, young people leaving leaving the church. Um, and so there's that kind of first mission field. What were some of the things that y'all found uh, to be of vital importance when you got there? As you heard these stories and you heard, I'm sure, parents who were very hurt and distraught and, and wanting to know what can we do different. When y'all became the, the boots on the ground there, what was kind of your, uh, your, your order of operation for how to begin to um, heal that, that problem? Um, it's a great question. Uh, we immediately focused on the kids and encouraged the best teachers to be in the kids' classes. Uh, we started a teen weekend to focus on the teens themselves. And in fact, we just had our 14th, uh, oh, wow. 14th teen weekend, wow. annual teen weekend, uh, just last weekend. And so that excitement was just uh, contagious and it spread through the whole congregation so everybody got involved and and then the kids were strongly encouraged to be a part of teen challenge which was a monthly gathering at somebody's home to get the uh, kids together and encourage community among Mm -hmm. themselves Uh, and camp became a big part of that as well let's go to camp uh, let's be in part of other teen weekends that we can go and be a part of and, and really focus on helping them grow in a relationship with Jesus, not just religion. 
Does that mm-hmm. make sense? And now it is religion, mm-hmm. but we, we wanted them to have their own faith and to help them grow in that faith. So there was a lot of time spent on, okay, what does the curriculum need to be? What do we need to encourage parents to do at home? Uh, and so it, it was just a complete uh, overhaul and change of, of focus. Now, that's not to say, and I'm very careful, Cheryl and I'm both very careful of this, just because we have ideas doesn't mean this is the idea and this is how you do it. And we are certainly not the parental gurus mm-hmm. of, you know, that our advice or wisdom is great. It's, you know, most of the time, half my, half my ideas are good. Other half are horrible, <laughs> but, but it, 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 and it's also a reminder kids are going to make their own choices, but we want to know that we did all we could to mm-hmm. foster an environment where their faith could flourish and could grow. And we were blessed. Uh, another thing that we did, too, is we made sure that they had mentors in their lives, other brethren. That was very important to us. You made sure you got your kids to hang out with and develop relationships with others who shared your values, who could guide them. And because when your kid becomes a teenager, they're done with you. They've heard you enough. They're going to need a fresh set of voices to speak to them. And they could say the exact same thing that you would say, but because it comes from their mouth, your kids go, oh, that's great. And you're like, hey, yeah, that's great. That's what you do. So we, we tried to foster that and encourage that. And, man, we were blessed. Uh, in our 12 years in Gainesville, uh, and I tracked the kids. I stayed in touch with all the kids as they grew and matured. You know, we, we were running like a 90% rate of faithfulness among our kids and I, I still stay in touch with them today those who have gone through the ranks and so it was a blessing and I think it came down that that became the focus of the congregation when your first mission yeah. field when your first mission field yeah wow so with, with that group um, I know it might be difficult to put a number on how many kids went through in those 14 years or so um, but you know, I, I would assume, I don't know, several hundred, right. I, I would guess, um, what were some of the main questions, challenges, hangups that they experienced, maybe not getting into the relational aspect. Cause I think that's what the parenting seminar has been helpful with, but, but maybe some of the, the skepticism and doubt that, uh, young people, you know, encounter either during high school or especially going on into college, what were some of the trends that you noticed that were leading people away from Christ? Yeah, there would be some at times, I guess, uh, maybe small specific things, but on, on the whole, the, the focus was, okay, here, if, if your life is centered around your kid's education to the point that that consumes you and that's everything and and that's your focus. For example, uh, many of the kids, many of the kids that end up in these highly accelerated programs, IB schools, extra special schools, I mean, that that is a red flag. I mean, it's an honor to be able to go there, but it's a red flag. Almost all those kids that we've worked with over the years end up in, in environments because of those high intensity uh, intellectual environments to be living in a world of doubt, especially when it comes to religion, especially when it comes to the Lord. And so uh, there's a red flag there. Be careful of that and be very proactive. And if your child's going to go be a part of that, you had better be on top of it and know exactly what's going into their ears and and be able to combat it, uh, whether it's dealing with apologetics or faith issues. Uh, Another thing was we were very, very, very conscientious of families that got consumed by sports. Again, sports is awesome. I love sports. But when you're on travel ball teams and you're gone all the time and you're not with the gang and that starts to consume you, that's another red flag. Be mindful, be mindful, be mindful that you're you're pulling your child away from their spiritual community and you're surrounding them with another community that isn't immoral or in of itself wrong, but you're separating a growth opportunity there. Uh, and, and then find families that just get too busy in their own thing and aren't involved with the whole. It becomes a me instead of a we. Be mindful of that. And so th- those were things that we would have conversations about and talk about. And to, and to me, those were more important than just a specific 
lesson or yeah. thought idea, or maybe we we dealt with this that the kids are concerned with uh, things that deal with doubt. Is there a God or this, that, and the other? Well, you know that stuff we would be mindful of and maybe hit with lessons when we needed to. But it was really those other bigger items. Mm that would be the things that were the challenge that and so you try to build your environment you tried to build your community where it was as as important as the others you know does that make sense definitely that makes so so much sense and another one that came to mind as you were talking is that seems in a similar vein is um complaining or uh the the way that families sometimes will talk about other church members oh, or the okay. way that uh, church is ordered or structured or complaining about elders just through the years and very limited experience that I have um, I've seen that to be somewhat of a trend that the families who tend to complain about church have kids who eventually leave the church no, and that's absolutely. not it's not a one-to-one ratio and and I, I think what's hard about it is there's a lot of parents who might who might think well that that was that's not us or that's never us because it's just so uh, complaining is like a default setting it's like what we just l- fall back into naturally it's just so easy to complain about what went wrong and so that we need this kind of like proactive positivism about uh, what's happening at church, not sweeping things under the rug, not being disingenuous and fake, because kids see right through that too. But, you know, I just, I've noticed that to be one of the things that has uh, caused, you know, kids to, to, you know, just have a dark look on the church, just a, a disinterested disillusionment. And they're just like, I, I want nothing to do with it. And it's because they've been trained to look only through that kind of critical lens. Is that something that... Yeah, oh, absolutely. I mean, I, it's on the parent because uh, your kids are going to act like you. They will act like you. If you're a complainer, they become a complainer. Uh, here, here's another thing that we did at Glen Springs that was so cool, uh, and it wasn't so much Cheryl or I. It was just the environment. Uh, g- going to church was fun. I hope that doesn't sound sacrilegious to anybody out there, but I mean, it's a blast to come and you feel like you're walking through some sort of hall of fame where everybody's cheering for you as you come in the door because there's so much excitement Mm -hmm. uh, and hugging and joking and laughing and, and that kind of fellowship spirit, that kind of joy carried over into the assemblies where people were not afraid to laugh in the assembly. Uh, They weren't afraid to cry. They weren't afraid to be transparent. And the singing just blows the roof off. And so there's that excitement of community there that is with it. And then, you know, making sure that the the lessons are edifying and uplifting and, 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 and have a purpose. Not just to have a lesson, to have a lesson, but have a purpose yeah. to advance the cause or to grow the faith. And 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 I think w- when your children see everybody serving the Lord with joy, well, that carries over. Hmm. They 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 sense that. They know that. And so it was important to continue to build that environment, uh, yeah. to build that joy, to where it was like, hey, it's time to go to church. Wow. Let's go. Yeah. You know, because you didn't want to miss it. And and even when Cheryl and I were at Glen Springs last week, <laughs> I don't go in a side door. I want to go through the front door, man. That's a fun place. That's where you meet everybody. That's where, you know, the, the laughing and, and the hugs and everything takes place. And, and yeah, you don't want to miss that. And so when your kids see you happy, they're going to be happy. When your kids see you greatly interested, they're going to be greatly interested. Yeah. When the kids see you saying, I don't want to miss this, then they say, I don't want to miss this. Yeah. Wow. So that that's a good segue into the second one, into the second mission field of friends, of people who are coming in and out of our assemblies, sometimes noticed, sometimes unnoticed. But I'll segue into that by saying I I remember that so well at Glen Springs. Everything you just described, it was almost like taking me back to that experience because it's so true. As soon as you walk through the door, there is an atmosphere that just permeates the air, and you feel it, and it's exciting. And 
And I recognize that that's not without intention, that that's not without planning and preparation and devotion to the task and a lot of hands on deck to make it work. And so let's let's talk about the second one. So now um, y'all have, uh, how long have y'all been in Tampa now and working with Valrico? Year and a half. Yeah, about a year and a half. Okay, yeah. so, so a year and a half in... And recently you shared within, what, the past, like, 15 months, there's been 24 baptisms. Yeah. Did I get those numbers yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, 24. So that's amazing. So just just tell us about that work. Break that down for us, and then let's talk about that second mission field of people who are coming into our assembly and the importance of not only our church family feeling that atmosphere of love and hospitality and excitement, but then integrating new people into the mix and leading them into a transforming relationship with Jesus. All right. Well, uh, uh, just f- forgive me. I love talking about this. So you just cut me off if I get to go on too long because this is we we referred to it as the Glen Springs way, and 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 it's nothing revolutionary. It's not a program. It's just organized community and 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 organizing the follow-up and so here here's the way it works first of all no visitor nobody touches the door somebody opens the door for you you have greeters there welcoming people cutting up with everybody as they come in you know you have your people at the door are really your office of first impressions and so they're there they're greeting everybody uh what was interesting in 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 gainesville (laughs) they were also the watchmen (laughs) People don't know that, but they're on the lookout. Some of them were former officers. Some of them are, are just good old boys from the country. But, you know, they're, they're, their eyes are open on, on everybody that comes in, but they're so friendly. So the first thing is you, you are immediately greeted. You don't open the door. The door is open for you. And, and that's really the message. The door is opened for you. You are welcome here. And then when you walk into the foyer, uh, the greeters are there and we call this our, our E team, our evangelism team. And, and they are there to focus on the visitors. Sure. We want to say hey to all of our members, but their eyes are like hawks looking for the people who are new, the visitors, and they go straight to them and they introduce themselves to them. They get to know them, and they are the ones who hand them the visitor card. Nobody just grabs a visitor card out of the pew. No, we hand that directly to you and welcome you. And and it's at that moment you begin to assess their needs. Hey, we're a family that's just moved to the area, and these are my kids. Or uh, we, we were seeking, just driving by, we don't know a soul here. But whatever you learn, uh, you you make sure you are listening so that you can share that with the rest of the team. And so if this family that just came in has kids and they're there for Bible class, you escort them to the Bible classes and introduce them to the teachers and introduce them to people as you go. So the evangelism team is out there. Now, what we had in, in Gainesville, and she's still there, is a lady by the name of Charlene Warren. And she is the most important part to our evangelism team because this lady is amazing. She literally writes down the name of every visitor who comes in the door. Now, we were a congregation of over 300, and so we would have lots of visitors at time. She was writing down their names. Now, she may have to get the name from somebody else on the E-team, but she is very aware of who the visitors are. And so what she's doing is helping us build a list of every visitor that comes in the door, and we we would help her do that. And so when Cheryl and I moved to Valrico and we were organizing the evangelism team there, we called this position the Charlene. (laughs) So we have two ladies who are our Charlenes uh, at Valrico, and, and they're helping us get those names. And so that's very important. So if you if you're on the E team and you give somebody a visitor card, you retrieve it. You you try to get it back. Now again, we're we're reading the room. You read their eyes. You read their mannerisms. If they're not interested in any kind of communication that way, hey, you don't force it. But if they accept it gladly and say sure, you get it back from them because that's vital information. Don't let them leave without getting away to reach out to them. And so then 
We encourage the whole congregation to be mindful of your visitors. Make room for them. Get out of your regular pew. Make room for the visitor. And keep this in mind. If you're most comfortable on the back row, well, they may be more comfortable on the back row. So why would you take the comfy seat away from them? So be willing to move and be willing to make room. And that's challenging when you have limited space in an auditorium. We get that. And so people have got to be willing to move. And so that's that's part of the environment that you want to build. So this family, this seeker feels comfortable because ultimately that's what you are. If anybody who walks in the door in any way where they're they're visitors who are just traveling from out of town or they're just driving by or they're checking you out they're a seeker and you want to be a seeker of seekers that's fish jumping in the boat don't miss the fish jumping in the boat don't let them get away from you and you don't have a hook or a way to reel them back in or to follow up with them so get that visitor card and so our e-team is also texting one another so once the assembly begins and everybody's in there you know, the E-team has a text thread going. <laughs> it, can, it, it can go through church. Uh, I hope people don't think that we're just playing on our phones, but it's like, hey, did you meet so-and-so? Hey, Phil, just to let you know, there's a family here, da-da-da-da. It might be good for you to look for them afterwards. I caught them. And so we're, we're very cognizant of who is there and who needs to follow up where. And people know, don't talk to us. If you're a member, don't run up to Phil and start talking about the Gator game or anything else going on because he doesn't care at that moment. We're yeah. focused on visitors, so don't get us distracted. Uh, and and I need to know that as soon as the lesson's over, the assembly's over, I know exactly where I'm going. And so I may even meet other members of the E-team in the back of the auditorium, and they say, hey, Phil, you better go catch this family. I'm going to go catch this family. So, I mean, it's working the whole time because later that day, we're going to shoot out an email to the entire team that's going to have a list of every visitor who visited that day. All your new visitors are at the top with all the information you were able to gather on them. Uh, and it includes address, phone numbers, what we may know about them, how we can serve them. And so we have all of our new visitors and then every returning visitor is listed. And then the third list that goes out on the email are visitors that had been visiting for a while but weren't here today be mindful we did not see this person you know and so that's sent out every uh, Sunday night or Monday and then you have people in the congregation who are willing to be your card writers your card writers send out cards because we want all of them to get you know three to five cards handwritten notes from members of the congregation Lord willing people who met them and can make it personal. Hey, I met you. I don't know if you remember me, but my name is so-and-so. And da 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 It was just great to have you today. Hopefully you can come back. So it's not just a blind card. You know, mm -hmm. it has some meaning behind it. And so you have your card writers. And then by the time I follow up with that person, either by phone or text or email later in the week, they've already been touched by a few folks. And it makes my follow-up easier. Yeah. And then so everybody is followed up with one way or another because when somebody visits for a while and we are looking for opportunities there and it it's somebody that you know hey they want to learn the gospel or they want to learn more about this church then they go into what we have created as a live document where everybody on the e-team can have access to it and there's somebody assigned specifically to follow up. Granted, we're all going to be in touch with them, but there's one person, you know, me or Ed, Cheryl, somebody is going to be the main contact. Hey, I know this person. I've had a great touch with them, or they're the person that I invited, or I was talking with Jared. Jared invited them, and Jared said, hey, Phil, do you mind helping me? Da, 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 da. Well, then they have that contact, and then we have information there where we can always uh, add to it. Hey, I had a study with them. Hey, I took them to lunch. Hey, uh, you know, I gave them a call and I heard this, that, and the other. And then you're always listening for opportunities to serve. Uh, cause a lot of people may have challenges going on in your life. You know, maybe it's a recent diagnosis. Maybe it's a, it's a job challenge. Maybe there's something else going on. Well, you add that to the live doc and we're going to try to help serve them in that way the best we can. And because people are hurting, they're looking, and, and we get to speak for the Lord, and we want to help heal that hurt. So that, that's what we do. 
and it's been very effective, very effective. And then you make sure you follow up. That's the main thing. Make sure you follow up and stay in touch and uh, you don't let people just slip through the cracks. Uh, you try to make a personal touch with them and, and move the relationship along. Wow. So forgive me, that was a lot. No, I'm sorry. No, that is that is fantastic. And uh, that's exactly what I mean by when when you walk in the doors of, of Glen Springs, that's what it felt like. But behind the scenes, you see there's kind of this mass operation that, that a lot of people don't know about. And maybe even within the church, some people aren't familiar with all the ins and outs and the gears that are turning to make this machine run like it is. And so I, I, I really, I really find that helpful. Um, I want to just, just quickly run back through it sure. in, in fast form and maybe ask uh, a couple of questions here and there. That way w- we just have it fresh on our minds. But uh, so number one, nobody touches the door. Right. Um, and I, what I like about that is it's, it's, about sending a message and that message is our doors are always open for you i love that i love that mentality that spirit and uh, i love how that's played out in specific action uh the e-team i just like that name first of all that's cool i mean who wouldn't want to be a part of the e-team uh but the e-team focus on visitors i wanted to ask about how many people are on the e-team i know there's a sense in which everybody's kind of involved but what what would be like the specific number on your e team at Glen Springs, or if the or if it's similar size, Valrico and Glen Springs both? But for a congregation of like three hundred, how many people do you have on your e team? Uh, ten. ten. It's about ten. Okay. Uh, it's about ten, uh, and and then we have some who are a part of the team who may not be as involved as others, but. They're there helping us great. We have a couple of older ladies who are just the sweetest things in the world, but they're not going to be able to run around to everybody, but they want to be in the foyer helping greet and helping get information. So there's about 10 of us. And then in the E-team, you have your Charlene's. Uh, You have those who are just greeters and and, um, visitor card retrievers. Uh, and then you have a few of us who are the Bible studiers as well as that, gotcha. you know, who, who are really going to get into the weeds and in the trenches with these folks. Okay, cool, cool. So, so about 10 on the E-team. And then from that core group, it kind of spreads out to the whole church, it sounds like. So there's this, there's this expectation that everybody is participating this and creating this special atmosphere and environment of making room, uh, which is, that's, I don't know if you know this, but that's our theme for the year. Our theme for this year is making room. So that was very fitting. That's great. But so that, so that's the idea, everybody making room. And I just want to make a special note of that because, uh, any, any, I think that's so helpful to to think about the idea of making room in a very practical way, because like you said, there's people who come in. If you're comfortable sitting in the back, most, I mean, how much more the visitor, right? Yeah. And so recently we've, uh, a lot of people have, uh, by way of invitation, moved up more to the front. We've kind of, we've got a mosh pit going in the middle is what it feels (laughs) like. So there's people in the splash zone now, so that's fun. Um, But we've got uh, in the, in the back, um, you know, finally, so, some more space where people can feel like they belong. And I think that's also helpful uh, for logistical reasons, because that makes it easier, I would imagine, for your E-team to say, okay, it, you know, I, I don't have to, you know, look carefully in, in the midst of every row. I mean, by then, they've already they've already been greeted. They've already, a lot of their information, but it probably makes it easier to follow up if there's that room in the back where you know most visitors are going to feel comfortable and your eyes can go there first. So there's just so many practical reasons I find that helpful. And then uh, the email list, that's so cool. Every Sunday that being sent out, um, both who was there and who was not there. And then the card writers, it sounds like that's a different group. It is. Than the E-team. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's kind of an expansion of the E-team. They're the people who uh, have just, they're, they're, they want to be involved. And this is a way that they can be involved. But here's here's the challenge we have for them, Jarrett, is we want them to meet visitors as well. 
Okay. You know, you keep your eyes open because you're going to be writing a card and it's going to be much easier to write that card if, if you actually met that person. But yeah, yeah. that's yeah. kind of an expansion of the 18. Okay, cool. Um, and I like the, the emphasis on that being personalized, not just this general, you know, just put a stamp, you mm-hmm. know, just stamp it and send it. But there's there's more to it than that. It's personalized. The live document where that's always updating, that's that's really cool. That's really helpful. Um, we, we actually have, I don't know a, a ton about it, but I know that there's a couple members here who have done some of these things. And I think that live document is part of it. And then, uh, I like the follow up of how can we serve? How can we serve? It reminds me of in, in John, when Jesus is walking along and two of John the Baptist's disciples are following close behind, and Jesus kind of senses their presence. He's like, turns around, and, he's, and he asks the question, what are you seeking? His first words in the Gospel of John, which I, I don't know if there's any meaning behind that, but I love that, because if you know the rest of the Gospel of John, it's like, that's it. That's what it's all about. And uh, he asks the question, what are you seeking? And so it's this, it's this uh, perceiving other people's needs, um, asking how can we serve them, and then of course his his invitation immediately following that. After he asks, "What are you seeking?" he says, "Come and see. Come and stay with me." Literally, in not in his own home, he doesn't have a place to lay his head, but come and stay where I'm staying. Experience my life as I'm living it in Christ, and just just be a part. And so, I I circle back around to that because what I hear in all of it is one, you have this like great system in place, but it doesn't lose its relational quality that it's all about relationships. And that's, that's the evangelism model for Jesus. What are you seeking and come and see an invitation to participate in, uh, in his life? Yeah, man, I hadn't thought about that passage, but that's a great passage to use for this, because uh, ultimately that's what you've got to do. We're we're always going to be more receptive to a relationship than a formula, and it's the old adage: people don't care what you know until they know how much you care. And if you can, and and that's our deal. That's what we try to remind everybody of. There's different levels of friendly. Everybody claims to be a friendly church. You ever notice that? Everywhere you've gone, you're a friendly church, and you're the visitor going, wasn't well, very friendly to me. Because friendliness can be very subjective. There's a friendliness that comes when you get on an elevator. There's elevator nice. Hi, how are you? What floor? But then you don't even want to look at them. You know what I'm saying? And you're just waiting for this to end, and you have to be quiet. And then they leave, and you say, have a good day. You know, that's it. Well, that's not our level of friendliness at church. Please, no, we can do yeah. better than that. Friendliness is not elevator friendliness. True biblical Jesus friendliness is making room mm. for someone in your life. And, and that's hard for us sometimes at church because another thing that we have to constantly remind each other of is some of us are blessed to have all of our family with us at church. Hey, there's mom, there's dad, there's aunts, there's uncles, and you have your own pew and you all go eat together right after church on Sunday. This is what you do. This is what you hang out with. And well, that's a blessing, but that's also a curse. Because if that's your focus when you come to church, you're not going to be a good evangelist. You have got to recognize you have to make room at your table. Yeah. You have to make room in your life. And, and we're the body of Christ. We got to be mindful of our cliquish attitudes. Yeah. And if you want to seek the lost, you have to make room for the lost. Yeah. It's not just hit them with some information and ask them to obey it and do it. No, 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 no. It's inviting them to be a part of your family. Yeah. You know, and that's the metaphor I like to use. Mm-hmm. We're a family of Christ. This is a family, and there's always room for another seat at this table. Always. Yeah. Oh, I love that. One one way that I've thought about it is like living life with an open door, an empty chair, and a ready room. 
Oh yeah. That like that's nice. Yeah, open door. There's always that that open door policy, welcoming people in an empty chair. If you don't have somewhere to sit, you can sit right here by me, or maybe I'm going out of my way to sit by you. And then if it if it calls for it, and and in fact, our hope even is that we've we've got a room prepared. Maybe even literally, you need a place to stay. We got you. You know, but that mentality of this sort of progression, an open door. Maybe that's all people want, but maybe they need that empty chair, uh, and then perhaps in the in the in the deepest level of relationship, that ready room, that desire. Hey, come make your home with us. We we want you here uh, in the long term. And so that that leads into one more question that I want to ask about this uh, this second missional field of sort of friends, people coming in and out of our group. How once people come. How do we get to that deepest level of sort of that ready room level where where because it's easy I think uh, what I sense in a, in a place like Lost River is we're really really good at um, greeting people welcoming people making them feel like they belong uh, and I think we're pretty good ab- about kind of following up but in a congregation of 600 people, we run into the Dunbar principle where you're kind of maxed out capacity of meaningful relationships. And so it can be hard for, for new people, whether they're members from other congregations who come over or people who have no background in the church at all to get to that level where they might be three years in and think, well, these people were really friendly for a year you know, making us feel welcome and apart, but we haven't experienced that depth of relationship. So is that part of the the E-team at all, or what has been y'all's experience with getting to a point? I know some of that just has to happen naturally, but is there anything that y'all have noticed either through the E-team or uh, just through your experience in churches that foster that sort of uh, bringing together of new members and actually making them feel like you're you're not only invited here but you are now a part of this family and we have deep meaningful relationship with you how do we get to that point uh well i think a lot of that's communication through the ranks from the e-team to the elders to the deacons to other members but let me i'll just take you through it for us so here's a seeker who's come in the door and we've been blessed with numerous people recently who had no ties to Valrico, none. And either they were invited by a friend or they were just driving by uh, or whatever reason brought them to us. Well, immediately, my responsibility as an evangelist who is longing to evangelize is we have to establish a relationship with this person. And we need to know that they have entered a realm where they're going to be cared for and heard. And so that begins with me and others willing to go get coffee with them, invite them to dinner, listen to them, find out where they are, what their needs are. And that just takes time. And, and as we've said many times, we've encouraged uh, the brethren, hey, if your friend bucket is too full that you don't have time, then let's just shake out the friend bucket. (laughs) Yeah, maybe you need to get rid of some dead weight. And, because we need got to make room for these folks because that's part of evangelism. And and so you listen to their needs. Uh, or, you know, I can just think of a few people right now that Cheryl and I have worked with recently, uh, whether it's a, it's a divorce home, whether it's, it's children issues, whether it's physical issues, you get involved in their life. You be there to help and aid with that. Because ultimately what you want to share with them is what you know. But they're going to be more receptive to hear what you know when they know how much you care. Mm-hmm. And so once you've got through that barrier, then you have an opportunity to sit down at a table and let's talk about faith. Yeah. And, and the way we do that is we listen. Well, where are you spiritually? Well, what are your thoughts about the Lord? What, what are your thoughts about church? How did you grow up? Where are you? And then you, you begin there from yeah. where they are. 
to to work through those things and establish that relationship because even when they are baptized into Christ and the Lord willing, that's where you want this to go, that they have a relationship with the Lord. You, it's not dunk and done. <laughs> yeah. They're a part of the family now and we continue to serve and, and we want them involved in things. And so yeah, that's passed on to the elders. Okay. Now we have to get this family, this person incorporated into our family to where they feel that they are a part and we're serving their needs and they have opportunities to serve among us. And so you have this uh, list that's before the elders. Here's our list of new Christians. And are they being integrated? Are they being assimilated into the whole? And so where are we with them? And so that's part of the discussion. And, 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 And that's something that's vital to the relationship with them that they have to feel now that they're a part of this family. And so we're going to have to, we're going to have to make room for them. We're going to have to keep that going. And so that's, that's something that's very important to this process. Uh, And, and here's the way we do it. Here's, here's kind of our verse. Uh, Be wise as serpents and harmless as Mm. doves. Be very wise, but at the same time, harmless as you maneuver these relationships with them. And so it takes some time and some discussion uh, and some planning. How are we going to do that? How do we move it along? Yeah, that's that's really helpful. Um, so, yeah, I think sometimes, like you're saying, we, we really reverse that. I think in my experience, not that this was necessarily taught, but just what I picked up on was a very... Um, individualistic and very intellectual model of evangelism that it was uh i meet people in the community and number one goal is to set up a bible study and walk through these propositions uh and uh, obviously uh, as you can probably guess that didn't go su- that didn't go super well usually ended up in i mean not like full on debate but just like it went absolutely nowhere and what i often found was a lot of the people who agreed to having a bible study loved jesus as much if not more than me and there's a place for talking about differences there's a place but i was going in with the spirit of like we want to i want to change your mind i want to and it's like it's just whatever that is that's not evangelism that is not that's not the model that we see throughout the New Testament, in the life of Jesus. And so leading with this with this idea of relationships, and I love how you said, like, once they're apart, um, getting them involved. Like, I think that's one of the greatest gifts that God can give to a church, like fired up new believers. I mean, what energizes a group well, more than that? Well, and speaking of that, we have a, a young man, uh, and, and this is what's been f- so fun at Valrico, uh, when we first got this organized and started going, there were some people who had already been visiting. They just really hadn't been followed up on. And one of them was a young man by the name of Tyler. And uh, Tyler's in his early 20s, and he would just visit every now and then. Well, I started to build a relationship with him, just following this moment, always looking for him, always trying to talk to him. And, and, and I never used the word study. I've never done that. I've never found that helpful. Hey, you want to have a study with me? Hey, you want, because that, 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 I don't know, for some reason in our minds today, for a lot of people that, that just maybe encourages conflict or division. I'm not sure why, mm-hmm. and that may be a bad way to characterize it, but nonetheless, we have found it's better to say when somebody's showing a lot of interest and they'll say something like, you know, I just have never felt that close to the Lord, or I haven't felt like, I said, well, would you like to learn? about how to do that yeah would you be willing to show me sure because if they ask for it it's a lot easier to share it and then you can sit down and talk and that's the way it was with tyler he said you know i i i I, i'm not sure where i am spiritually and and i was baptized as a kid not sure where i am and 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 so he and i just developed a relationship where he was making those kinds of statements and i said well would you like to think about this more. Could I help you be a little more confident in your salvation? He's like, sure. What, what? Yes. Great. So we would meet and talk and I would just share verses with him and just share uh, things with him. And, but once he became a Christian, (laughs) this is where I'm going with this. He's now our top evangelist. He invites the world and he immediately, immediately said, Hey, can I be on the E-team? 
uh, yes, <laughs> yes. And so he's the guy standing at the door every time. He's invited. In fact, two co-workers have already become Christians that work with him. And he's got a third that's coming now, and as well as his brother, you know, yes, Tyler, you can definitely be a part of it. And so there's that energy uh, that that comes from that. Yeah. And then that just energizes the whole group when you have that kind of spirit out there. Yeah, that's amazing. Reminds me of the woman at the well. You know, she, she <laughs> after, you know, meeting the Messiah at this well, runs into town, leaves behind the water jar, her old way of life, and says the same words that Jesus started with in John chapter 1, come and see and uh that that excitement that energy that that new followers of jesus bring is like i said just one of the greatest gifts that i think god can give to a church and that i think is a good segue into the 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 third missional field here and we'll hit these last two a little bit a little bit quicker because i know the uh the second one was what we really wanted to focus on all the work at balrico but getting into this third missional field of sort of the the fellow citizens to take uh to to stick with the f's there um the fellow citizens i like what you said about kind of in rebuttal to getting stuck in the dunbar principle of you have like like five really intimate close relationships and then i think it's like 15 uh medium and then like you're you're maxed out at like a hundred meaningful relationships. That principle is true, yes, but in rebuttal to that, what if the call for us as Christians is to every so often take inventory of of if we are or aren't maxed out, and if we're maxed out, empty that friend bucket. Not dump everybody out and cut ties and don't talk to anybody, but, but the same idea of making room. So yes, Dunbar principle, that's a real thing, but there may come a time where if it is maxed out, then you got to make some changes. And so that leads into, I think, this this field where when people are in their uh, jobs, careers, when they're out in the community and they're meeting people, I think sometimes Christians don't do well in this missional field because they're maxed out. They have so many amazing, good, deep Christian friends that all their time is spent with either their immediate family or the family of Christ, and so they, their friend bucket's full. And so how do, we, how do we adjust that in a healthy way? And then I would love to hear about your own experiences because I remember uh, you know, hearing about Glen Springs. I mean, the, the people that you connected with, the, the friends that you made, and the ways that they knew how much you cared uh, was really impactful for me to hear. And I, I know that would be helpful for all of us to hear about that. So let's talk about that third missional field. Well, I think if you're—and and that's a challenge. We live in the South, and we live in communities— that are filled with brethren, and that's a blessing. But we've got to recognize that blessing can be a curse. And if we're consumed with nothing but our own family and our own church friends and we don't have time, we need to do a healthy audit of who and what we are spiritually. Uh, and, And we've got to make room for this. I think that's important. And uh, the Fran Bucket analogy, yeah, it, it's time to make room. And, and, and so to be somebody who can see the fellow citizen, here's, here's kind of the mantra for me and Cheryl. Evangelism is not done as much with the mouth mm. as it is with the ears and the eyes. You are listening for opportunities and you are looking for opportunities because there's people all around us who are hurting, they're confused. We just need to be mindful and open to it. And 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 so you listen for opportunities to serve them. Uh, you listen for opportunities to reach out to them. And, and you've got to be looking for them, whether in the coffee shop or they're at the gym or they're in the workplace. But you'll you'll hear of the challenges in their life and and hey. I, I heard that about your mom or your dad or, or what's going, hey, 
I'm going to keep that in prayer. Do you mind if I keep that in prayer? Or I've, I've heard about your, your children and, and there's this, that, and the other. Have, have you ever thought about sending them to camp? Because, you know, my kids go to this camp and man, it's such an awesome opportunity and they get around such good kids. You're looking and listening for opportunities. And, and, and I think one of the ways that we've always thought evangelism to be, it's, I'm looking for an opportunity to get a Bible study. Who can I just drop this card on? Will you study the Bible with me? And, and there's nothing wrong with that, but I don't think that's very effective today in, in some communities. Yeah, that may work in a foreign evangelism field uh, where life is so hard that people are looking and looking desperately uh, to find some hope. But here we live in the land of prosperity. And prosperity is not our friend. And it makes it hard to find people. So we're going to have to be open. And we're going to have to be looking and listening for those opportunities so you can make those touches. And, uh, you know, <laughs> I, I found when I was at a CrossFit gym, and you talk about a different world. Oh, my. Uh, moral world, you know, it's a different world. But there were so many opportunities to listen and and as well as there were opportunities to encourage and it was a way to build build relationships and and after a while some of my friends would come to church and some of them still you know are growing spiritually in in different ways but you have to be willing to make time for them and make time for those opportunities so it's listen and look listen and look listen and look yeah what i hear in that is seeking their best interests, willing the good of the other. And of course, we want, you know, at the end of the day, we want to lead people into a transforming relationship with Jesus. We want people to be baptized and to become a part of the church. But it it leads with simply willing the good of the other, willing their best and what I've seen and experienced even just in myself is is this tendency at times to almost subconsciously and unknowingly turn people into projects where it's like, all right, you know, you're my target. You're my fish. I'm going after you. I'm, I, you know, now, now I gotta, I gotta convert you. And, um, and then it leads back into that, like, hyper individualistic and intellectual model that I was used to. And, and it's just, that's not, it's not, and people see right through it too. You know, people know when, when you're just, when you have some agenda in mind. And so it's, I mean, it's a hard balance. It's like this tension to navigate where it's like, yes, I guess if you, if you want to say we have an agenda, there's an agenda. But it's because I this is the life that I have experienced in Christ, and I just want you to experience that too. And I'm just I'm willing the good of the other. And so that that starts with I think what you're saying, the looking and seeing, and like that's that's Jesus throughout his life. I mean, think about how many times it says that um, in seeing the crowds, he felt compassion. It's like, do I see the crowds that way? I'm like. You know, I'm like, ah, the, you're, people are in my way, not I see through the eyes of compassion. I'm looking at their needs. I'm reading the room. I'm seeing their expressions, and I'm noticing uh, and then feeling the compassion, and that compassion compels me to uh, to lead them to Christ by simply making a meaningful connection with them. Um, so yeah, I like that looking and listening. That's where it all begins. Yeah. Well, and, 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 and I think we got to bear in mind too, is we become a seeker of seekers. And if somebody's not seeking, it's going to be hard to communicate that with them. And, and we can't, we can't feel obligated to try to force that where our goal is to try to help them become a seeker because when they ask for it, then, then you have more opportunity. And so You've got to be mindful. I mean, you think of the people the way the Lord worked with people. You know, Zacchaeus was a seeker. You know, the woman at the well became a seeker. Uh, he he was able to develop a relationship where they sought it. And, and that's what we've got to be mindful of, too. You can't force it. Yeah. And so you want to become a seeker of seekers. And let me add this to everything, too. One of your greatest evangelistic tools is your assembly mm. and especially singing. That's one of our greatest evangelistic tools. 
uh, because we live in a world that is going to come into an assembly like ours and it's going to shock them because of what's not there. This is weird. This is odd. And they're going to think one of two things when we start singing. Wow, this place really needs a band. This is horrible. Or they're going to think, I wouldn't put a piano in here for nothing. This is amazing. And so the worship assembly needs to be inspirational. And I think that's important. I think that's very important. Uh, Just like you wouldn't put anybody up in the pulpit because you got to be mindful of the way we may say things and you don't want whoever gets up there to ruin your opportunity with your visitor that you brought. You know, don't go up there and do anything dumb that now I've got to clean up your mess. You know, the same way that our, our, our worship service, you know, our singing, everything that we do, I think needs to be inspirational because we got to be mindful of that, that we, we need to build an environment that is drawing people to the Lord, yeah. you know, and, and I'm not, don't, don't, don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying uh, some superficial mm-hmm. that's all built on feelings and emotion. No, not at all. Not at all. But, but it, it, it needs to be something that makes people go, whoa, yeah, this is worship. Now, this is worship. I, I want to be a part of this. Yeah. And I, I think that's important. And, and especially in Gainesville, that was one of our best evangelistic tools. If we got you to the building, we got you. You know, yeah. there, there, there's great opportunity there because uh, they, their, their desire to seek is going to shoot higher. Yeah. Well, it's interesting you say that because within the past like two months, someone made that exact comment. Someone was visiting from the outside. Opening note blew them away. Not because we're the most talented singers. I mean, we have some very musically talented people here. But they just had never experienced anything like that. And and so how much more does that call us to, you know, we, we just get so used to it. We take it for granted. You know, most people grew up with it. And it's sometimes it's almost like people almost view it as a, as a bore. It's like, all right, we've got three songs and then the sermon is really what we're here for, or maybe not at all. <laughs> and so it's just like, it's just going through the motions. And, uh, and I, I think... Yeah, there's there's something so unique and special that we take for granted that visitors almost always are blown away by, and and that should call us to just sing with even more heart and enthusiasm because there's a good chance it's somebody's first time ever hearing that, and, and that's seeing evangelism. That too. And yeah. that's evangelism. Yeah. Everybody's a part of this. Everybody's mm. a part of this, and that's what we try to remind everybody at Valrico, and like we did again. Hey, you're a part of this. You are a part of this. I need you to sing out because you're preaching a powerful sermon when you sing these songs. Yeah. Uh, I need your joy to to be something that is contagious throughout the rest of the congregation, you know, and especially the visitor. Uh, and so we we need you to do that because yeah. I need that. I need yeah. that because. I want to go back to this person later this week, or I want to go back to them and, and say, so what'd you think, yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and, and I want it to be something that is uplifting to yeah. them to where they say, oh, I'd like to have more of that. Yeah. yeah. And th- that makes me think about one, one other thing of the uniqueness of people from the outside experiencing the singing within worship there are, I think, a lot of things within the life of a Christian community that are like that. So I, I think I would, I'd agree with you that it's like assembly should be, you know, su- Sunday gathering should be like, if you come in those doors, we got you, you know. But I think there's other things that are so unique, even a Christian family household, you know, uh, when people experience that, there's something unique, there's something special about that in you know, I, I had a friend growing up who uh, didn't really grow up in a Christian home, but he came to our home and he experienced something that was very different. And eventually, years later, he became a, a Christian, partly because of, of those early experiences in middle school and high school, seeing that. And then also just the Christian fellowship outside of the church building, like being brought into uh a, a smaller environment where you're in people's homes and you're p- just sharing a meal together and praying together, that is another thing that just like that singing in worship, that just kind of 
blows people away. It's like, there's something different here. There's, there's a different atmosphere. The Lord is in this place. Uh, that, that, there's so many opportunities like that. And I think uh, inviting people into homes is like top of the list. Um, because it's it's that oh yeah relational. I mean hospitality yeah. that that's one of your greatest tools of evangelism. And look at the first century saints. How often hospitality yeah. w- was mentioned and even commanded uh, of our shepherds. You yeah. know, and and you see it among the saints, and you see that as one of Gaul, Paul's great uh, admonishments in Romans twelve when he talks about hey here's a transformed life. Be hospital, yeah. hospitable. Uh, be the person who is, you know, open to all, and especially those of the household of faith. So, so absolutely, and and those are great opportunities. Your team weekends, yeah. your special gatherings. These are opportunities to get people to experience this community, to experience this faith that aren't exactly church yet. Yeah, you know, but you're moving them closer along, and and we've seen that to be a great tool for us over the years. Yeah. So love it. Yeah. So last one, the the field of, of foreign evangelism. Let's just uh, approach it just by talking about this upcoming trip. Um, I think this could be a whole other episode, and I actually think I'm going to get to talk with someone specifically about foreign evangelism maybe in the next month or two. But I do just want to end by hearing about uh, this trip coming up, what y'all are excited for, and what that's going to be like. Well, when I when I took the job at Florida College, uh, one of the things that Dr. Weaver was willing to let me do uh, was to be involved with the students, and I wanted to in, to be a part of the team to help inspire them to take their career, take their education, and and use it in a way that it glorifies the Lord. That you become a kingdom worker. And so that includes, you know, becoming uh, evangelist. And so we, we've been in looking for ways to get the kids to go with missionaries. Uh, we've had kids go to uh, Jamaica already, Honduras, and then Cheryl and I are taking uh, some students, and we're going to go to the Philippines during spring break because we know that it's going to be transformational for them yeah. just to see a different world. I mean, I've been down to Nicaragua. I've been to Mexico. I, I, I've seen people who live in homes that have dirt floors uh, that are in poverty, but mentally, emotionally, spiritually, they're much richer than me. Yeah. And and so we want the students to experience that and and to see that their education is now going to become a resource opportunity, whether it's making money. You know, you, every, every single one of us have time, talent and treasures and everything that the Lord asks of us is what he's already given us. Yeah. So you've been given this opportunity to get an education. Now we want you to be inspired to share it with others. And so taking them to the Philippines is, is a way to do that. And, and let me just say, I'm not your guy to talk to about the foreign evangelism fields. I'm pure rookie. I just get excited about it and want to go with others. I, I am clearly not the expert there, but I know that this is a way to help inspire students to be mindful that they can now become great instruments in the kingdom and that's what we want this to do. So we're going to go and hang out for a week and visit a few churches. We're going to do some VBS style teaching. We're going to do kind of some camp. Uh, the, uh, the, the kids will become camp friends, and we're going to work with some of the older teens in that way. Uh, I'm going to do some studies with some preachers over there, and then we're just going to have some assembly time and hang out with the saints. So that they're going to have opportunities to get involved. Uh, the students are to, to be a part of this teaching process as well. Yeah. Wow. That's so awesome. I'm excited for y'all to, to do that. Excited for the students. I mean, I really wish they had something like that when I was there. I <laughs> would have eaten that up. Well, I actually did get to go to Jamaica with the Tants. Yeah, you went so, with the Tants. Good. Um, so that was really cool. And we, it was like a, about a group of 10 students who went and w- seriously, like one of the most transforming experiences of my life. That's, that's actually where I decided that I wanted to preach. It was the first trip I made to Jamaica and actually leads to how I kind of wanted to wrap this up. I remember uh, David Tant walked into the hotel room Saturday night and was like, 
hey, which of you guys want to preach? And my two roommates, my two best friends looked at me and I had no one else to look at. And so I was like, oh, great, I'm, I'm up. And so I preached this sermon in another country and the only time I've been out of the country. And, uh, you know, I, I still remember it. Um, I try not to remember the sermon itself because <laughs> it was just not any good, I know. But they were so, so gracious, and I was so thankful for that opportunity, even though I was uncomfortable and, and unsure of myself and all of that. And I remember on the van ride back into Mo Bay, it just dawned on me. I'm like looking out the window in the Great Commission, Matthew 28, 19, go make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you. And surely I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And that just that just hit me in a different way. And I know it doesn't mean, like, like we started this, no mission field is more important than another. That doesn't mean that you have to go to another country and that's how you fulfill the Great Commission. There's the mission field of our high school and middle middle school students right here and your own families to pour into. But somehow I think it's good to be involved in, in all these sort of four main categories, these four main missional fields. But But it just hit me in a different way. And that's what really motivated me to go down this path of of preaching and what's stuck with me most from this verse is two things. First, it gets right back around to this relationship. Um, he says, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. There is no more loving and deep and relational community than the Trinity, right? Yeah. Father, Son, and Spirit. It's like, we're, this is not just a label we slap on people when they come up out of the water or right, right, right when we're about to dunk them. It's like, no, when you're, when you're baptized, you have now become a part of the life and love of the triune God. It's so inherently relational. And then the part that resonated with me most uh, on that van ride back into Mo Bay there in Jamaica was surely I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. I needed to hear that then. I was so like nervous and didn't know what I was doing and still don't. And that constant reminder within this great commission, hey, if you're in these missional fields, I'm with you. Do we as individual Christians and as a church want to be close to Jesus? Well, the surest way to be close to Jesus is to go where he said he would be with us, and that's into these fields of mission, because as he said, the fields, wherever they may be, are ripe for harvest, and what an exciting and awesome thing it is that we get to be the ones who continue his kingdom work right here on earth. Yeah, well said, man. I can't say any better than that, yeah, and he lets us do that, Yeah. so it's great, so yeah, we're excited. We, we're going to go over and hang out a week in the Philippines, and then next year, or actually even later this year, uh, we could be going somewhere else. Um, I know that I've already talked to preachers in Malawi, uh, Kenya, India. Wow. You, know, you know, I think that's important. That's just part of a good education when you're seeking to train up the whole person in service to the Lord and in yeah. the world. And Absolutely. So, yeah, we get to do that. And so it is amazing. Yeah. The Lord lets us speak for him. <laughs> Go figure. Yeah. Well, Phil, thank you so much for, uh, for, for being here for this whole weekend. Um, we, we love having you here. And last year, I know it made such an impact on all our parents. And, uh, and that's continued over. And, and now this year, having both you and Cheryl here, I think, is just so helpful to us as a church. And so thank you both for for coming and, and and being here this weekend and then especially thanks for this time that we got to sit down and just talk about the way of evangelism the day-to-day -day life of living as a good newser for god and his kingdom thank you jared really appreciate you I'm very proud of you brother